Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. Over the next couple of episodes, we're going to be examining the relationship between China and the Soviet Union and how this relationship determined the development of China's economy and international relations in the 1950s and early 1960s. Today, we're going to start by discussing the Korean War of 1950 to 1953, as this conflict was crucial in shaping Sino-Soviet relations in the early 1950s. The Korean War is considered one of the many proxy conflicts that characterised the Cold War period, which was a series of indirect showdowns between the US and the Soviet Union from the end of the Second World War till the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the complete collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The Cold War was essentially a battle for global influence between the two superpowers and their blocs, the democratic liberal Western allies led by the US and the Communist Eastern Bloc in Central and Eastern Europe, East Asia and Southeast Asia, led by the Soviet Union. Other major events of the Cold War include the Berlin Blockade, the Second Arab-Israeli War, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. These events shaped global geopolitics, while many ordinary people prepared for what was assumed to be an inevitable nuclear catastrophe guaranteed by mutually assured destruction, or, as it's sometimes known, MAD. As such, the Korean War was not an isolated event, but rather one in a series of conflicts that determined how China would interact with other nations for the next few decades, and in some cases until the modern day. Though we'll mainly be focusing on China's relationship with the Soviet Union, we'll also be touching on Sino-US relations, as well as China's relationship with North Korea. Before we go any further, however, a brief recap of Sino-Soviet relations until 1950 will probably be helpful. You may remember many episodes ago, when we discussed briefly the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, that it was a member of the Comintern named Ma Ring who had been sent by Lenin himself to help found the fledgling party in 1921. The CCP was, at its core, a Leninist party. The party was the vanguard, leading the proletarian dictatorship, and it practiced democratic centralism, it fought imperialism, and it promoted class consciousness. You'd think that this fact would put China in Stalin's good books in the 1950s, but in fact Stalin was rather wary of China and Mao, and the relationship did not necessarily get off to a great start following the end of the Second World War. If you remember, during the 1920s and 1940s, the Soviet Union had wanted the CCP to cooperate with the nationalist government and infiltrate their ranks from within but this had backfired following the White Terror and subsequent fallouts during the Civil War period. The CCP failed to bring the nationalists on side, and the Soviet Union also failed to win the Chinese government over. This was essentially the first failure of the relationship between the CCP and the CPSU, despite the fact that the CCP would actually go on to win the Civil War, getting rid of the nationalists for good. Initial relations were further soured by the early agreements between the two nations in 1949, after the founding of the PRC. Just two months after the founding of the People's Republic, Mao led a delegation to Moscow in December of 1949 to establish strong ties between what he obviously considered a weak nation and a much stronger one. But Mao did not necessarily get what he expected from his big brother nation, the Soviet Union. Stalin suspected China of trying to forge its own path, free from Soviet oversight, as had happened in Tito's Yugoslavia, and he was not too thrilled at Mao's cooperation with existing ranks of non-communists and even capitalists within China, as he feared that this would lead to the development of pro-Western economics in China. As such, Stalin dilly-dallied in forming the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance, the core military and aid pact between the two countries that was meant to solidify their relationship. To the outside world, this treaty was a clear sign of commitment between the two parties, but the same cannot be said for China's view on the matter. In a separate security treaty, Mao was hoping for a guarantee of military assistance in capturing Tibet and Taiwan, but all he got was a promise to help if the Japanese invaded, the withdrawal of Russian troops from parts of the northeast, and a loan of $300 million to be paid back over five years. They also had to concede the independence of the Mongolian Republic, which Mao had been hoping to reincorporate into the Chinese nation, and which now fell neatly under Soviet influence. 
Despite the tensions in this relationship, the CCP needed the assistance from Stalin and the Soviet Union not only to secure their own rule in China, but also for the more general aim of spreading communism internationally. Military weapons, loans, expertise, student exchanges were all provided to China, at a cost, and the CCP were not only grateful, but also reliant on these provisions from the Soviet Union. It was China's entry into the Korean War, defending Kim Il-sung's regime from the Americans, that changed not only the Sino-Soviet relationship, bringing the two nations much closer, but also the outlook for international communism, as well as global attitudes towards communist regimes. Now let's discuss the Korean War itself. Japanese Korea had been divided into two following the end of the Second World War, the northern half administered by the Soviet Union and the southern half administered by the US. Despite this, neither side seemed particularly interested in what was going on in the peninsula in the five years following the war, as tensions escalated to the point of military clash in June 1950. While China was busy preparing to invade Taiwan, America was drafting a new statement on their defensive perimeter in the Asian Pacific, which ran from the Aleutian Islands, which are a chain of islands between Alaska and Russia, Japan, Okinawa and the Philippines, and neatly circumvented Taiwan and Korea. The Soviet Union didn't seem too invested in the region either, and it should also be noted here that they actually never sent troops into the Korean War despite promising some air support for China. As late as October 7th, they were actually advising China to just leave the Koreans to their own devices. This nonchalant atmosphere was broken on June 25th, 1950, when North Korean forces crossed the 38th parallel, which separated the North from the South, capturing Seoul and pushing the South Koreans towards the coast. The UN declared invasion, while the Soviet Union argued that the North was merely responding to provocation. Regardless of semantics, the UN Security Council sent troops from 15 nations to help the US in pushing back the northern regime, while the US also deployed a fleet in the Taiwanese Strait to guard against possible CCP invasion during the chaos. So that's how the war started. How did China get involved in the fighting exactly? There is some debate surrounding the reasons as to China's entry into the conflict, which also call into question whether or not China knew about Kim's plan to invade the South beforehand, or whether they were caught off guard like everyone else. In the 1950s, Western observers assumed that Mao had simply responded to a direct command from Stalin to protect communist interests in the region. But this idea was basically dismissed in 1960s when studies of Chinese news media showed that China only began taking an interest in the conflict in September when the US advancement had threatened to invade North Korea. This amounted to a border security issue in China, which could not be tolerated. A joint declaration issued by the CCP and other parties within China announced in September that for the people of China to aid the people of Korea in their struggle against the US, is not merely a moral responsibility, but also a matter closely related to the vital interests of our own people, a decision necessitated by the need for self-defence. However, Beijing had actually begun moving troops northwards after the US had deployed a fleet to patrol the Taiwan Strait back in June, once they had realised that an invasion of Taiwan was now impossible. This suggests that the real motivating factor of China's involvement in the war was retaliation against what they considered to be armed aggression against the territory of China. Other Chinese commentators have argued that China was most concerned about the fate of Korea and the destiny of international communism, while still others argue that China wanted to guarantee Soviet economic aid and military assistance for the future. But if either of those were the case, then they probably would have sent in troops in July or August when the US actually first entered the fray. As it stands, China did not send troops into Korea until after the US had crossed into the northern border in mid-October, and that was only after much persuasion from a prominent general named Peng Dehuai, who would later go on to be China's defence minister. Even then, the Chinese were still reluctant to deploy, as they were still recovering from the civil war, and so they sent in what was known as the Chinese People's Volunteers, or the CPV, to the peninsula, probably as an effort to seem less aggressive. One recent study, published in 2018, argues that China's main objective in joining the war was to stop US advancement without actually having to do any fighting. 
Remember that at first, no one thought that America would interfere in the Korean conflict in the first place. So many parties were betting on the fact that the US didn't really want to be there and would back off once they had secured the South. This obviously didn't work out, and Mao even rejected a ceasefire agreement put forward by the UN in 1951, as by that point the conflict was actually turning in their favour, and they wanted to take the opportunity to strike back at the Americans while the iron was hot. Whatever the true reason for China's entry into the war, I think it's safe to say that no one thought it would be as bloody or protracted as it turned out to be in the end. Another question is, did the CCP know that the North would invade the South? It seems that Kim told China that he might plan to invade, but nothing was set in stone, and the Chinese made no formal commitments other than a promise to defend the North if the Americans invaded, which in the end they did. This would explain their slow response at the beginning of the war, which only changed once the US had put their fleet in Taiwan, which really angered the Chinese and possibly mobilised them into action. In general, it's been accepted that while no one knew what was going to happen, there was conflict in the air in East Asia, and if Korea had not become the epicentre, it most likely would have been somewhere else, either in Taiwan, Hong Kong, or possibly further south in Southeast Asia. Initial fighting saw Chinese and North Korean forces successfully push the US-UN alliance back across the 38th parallel, and the joint forces managed to recapture Seoul in what was a decisive turn in the momentum of the war. The Chinese troops had gained a reputation for being fierce guerrilla fighters and stealthy tacticians. One US history source said of the CPV, quote, The Chinese coolie, in the padded cotton uniform, could do one thing better than any other soldier on earth. He could infiltrate around an enemy position with unbelievable stealth. Only Americans who have had such an experience can realise what a shock it is to be surprised at midnight with the grenades and submachine gun slugs of gnome-like attackers who seem to rise out of the very earth. It was not mass, but deception and surprise which made the Chinese Reds formidable. By December of 1950, despite the Chinese troops being exhausted, running low on ammunition, and in some cases at risk of freezing or starving, Mao decided to push ahead with another third offensive, ignoring pleas from the UN to discuss a ceasefire. China rejected their January ceasefire proposal, wanting instead to pursue a decisive victory that would push out both UN troops and the Americans. This actually worked in the US's favour, as the US had accepted the ceasefire in order to seem peaceful and non-aggressive, but in secret they were actually really concerned about backlash both internally and from the Koreans. It also allowed the Americans to label China as the aggressor in this situation, shifting the blame and successfully getting the UN to condemn a different nation. Soon after, the military conflict also turned in the US-UN alliance's favour. The front lines of the battle were pushed deeper into North Korea throughout 1951 and marked the complete failure of the CPV and North Korean army to expel the foreign United Armies. The Chinese were at a huge disadvantage, having no aircraft or anti-aircraft equipment, and by mid-1951 they had lost around 50% of their troops. The only reason it seems the Chinese army wasn't decimated at this point was because of truce talks that had started in July 1951. The UN at this point had decided to ease off the pressure in order to aid negotiations, which allowed the Chinese some time and space to recoup. Only a further two years of a war of attrition, which saw the first use of jet fighters to engage in air combat, was an armistice signed in 1953. The war was suspended, but the long road to recovery for both North and South Korea had only just begun. The war in Korea was also known in China as the War to Resist US Aggression and Aid Korea. Though it proved very costly in terms of troops, it did create the opportunity for one of the most important mass campaigns of the early 1950s. The Resist America Aid Korea campaign instructed citizens to neither be afraid nor admiring of the US, making sure that the US was portrayed in all propaganda as a reactionary and imperialist nation that was trying to get involved in Chinese internal affairs. The United States became a firm enemy, and thus any military conflict against the Americans was not only justified, but also desirable. The point of the campaign was not only to inspire patriotism and promote the CCP, 
but also to justify the enormous cost and personal sacrifice of the Chinese on behalf of what was essentially a foreign war. The tactics used were the usual that we discussed in the episode on mass campaigns. The posters are actually particularly colourful, and I'll try and put some examples up on the Sinobabble website so you can see some for yourself. Interestingly, the Aid Korea part turns up a lot less in propaganda than you might expect, further proving that the real reason that China got involved was more to do with protecting its own interests rather than helping out a fellow communist nation. It may be useful to remember that the other campaigns that we spoke about last week, land reform and the anti-campaigns, as well as the campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries and the introduction of the new marriage law, were all taking place at the same time as the Korean War and the Resist America Aid Korea campaign. This was a very important time for the consolidation of the CCP's regime in China, and the Resist America Aid Korea campaign played a huge role in that, though it could be argued that the casualties suffered didn't quite make up for the boost in morale. Casualties on all sides were not trivial. US casualties were over 160,000, South Korean 400,000, North Korean 600,000, and Chinese somewhere between 700 and 900,000. Among the Chinese deaths was Mao Zedong's eldest son, An Ying, who was 29 at the time and who was interred in Korea. Now let's discuss some of the immediate and long-term impact of the Korean War. Some of the immediate effects included China's exclusion from the UN for the next two decades due to its being branded an aggressor nation, the failure of the liberation of Taiwan due to the interjection of the US fleet, and an increase in tension between the Soviet Union and China. The conflict and the accompanying campaign helped to promote the idea of Western imperialism, represented by the US, as the enemy of the Chinese people. While the Chinese army was fighting on the front lines, the Soviet Union mainly stayed out of the fighting, instead opting to sell out-of-date weapons to China at high interest rates. The Chinese spent about $10 billion on the Korean War, a heavy price to pay for border security. However, these grievances did not actually emerge until much later in the late 1950s and the 1960s, after the death and subsequent denouncement of Stalin. On the surface, the Sino-Soviet alliance was stronger than ever, and the two countries were able to continue working together, with the Soviet Union maintaining its role as big brother nation until at least the end of the first five-year plan in 1957. I don't want to go too much into modern day politics, as that would risk stealing the spotlight from later episodes, but I think it's worth just highlighting a few things here. After the end of the Cold War, The US was essentially left as the only superpower in the world, the Soviet Union having been brought down by internal revolutions, and the Kremlin's power reduced significantly. At the same time, Sino-US relations had been improving steadily from the mid-1960s, as China had gradually rid itself of Soviet control and sought to establish peaceful relations with the world as a developing nation looking for allies and trade partners. This meant that Sino-US relations were actually very peaceful up until very recently, when China began expressing itself as the counterweight superpower and exerting dominance particularly in Asia, which threatens some of the US's allies including Taiwan and Japan. Add to this the Belt and Road Initiative, issues of Chinese technology and spyware, and the rise of exporting American jobs to factories in China, and you basically end up where we are today. In short, the current tensions and what some are characterising as the Second Cold War is a result of the diminishing influence of the Soviet Union and the rise in China's independence and economic development since that time. I remember reading once that the world always needs two superpowers to prevent one nation from becoming too dominant and having a hegemony on global discourse. Perhaps the rise of China is a sort of restoration of balance, especially as the United States has dominated international politics since basically the beginning of the 20th century. The second major relationship we should discuss is that between North Korea and China. Immediately following the war, both China and the Soviet Union provided aid to North Korea to help them rebuild and begin their economic recovery. However, the good times were not to last, as an attempt to oust Kim Il-sung from power in the mid-1950s, supported by the Soviets and China, failed. This led to a deterioration in relations between the two nations, 
as Kim criticised Mao and the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, after which things remained shaky. Until around 2018, China had criticised North Korea's nuclear arms plans, fearing a destabilisation of the peninsula, while North Korea has remained fearful of China's interference in the region. While the two parties remained friendly on the outside, with China promising to defend Korea from outside invasion, even throughout the low point of their relationship, this is not too dissimilar to China's relationship with the Soviet Union, which was essentially a compromise to protect the global communist alliance. Somewhat ironically, relations have begun to improve now that North Korea has expressed support for China's amazing human rights deeds, commenting on the excellent way that it has dealt with the situation in Xinjiang and the issues of independence in Hong Kong. Who would have guessed that it would have taken such events for these two parties to come back together, brothers in arms and oppression? We'll end on the note of how the Korean War is commemorated in China. Not long after the end of the war, a memorial hall for the Resist America Aid Korea War was built in Dandong, a border city between North Korea and China. I've actually been to Dandong. It's um, not particularly interesting or well-developed, but if you go there, then you get to see the end of the Great Wall of China, and it's very short and inexpensive, and it's a nice walk. At the top of the wall, there's a little telescope, and you can use it to look into North Korea, which is um, probably less interesting than it actually sounds. The Memorial Hall was closed for a while during the Cultural Revolution, but after the 1980s, interest in the Korean War and memory of the event began to spread from Dandong into other cities such as Beijing and Shanghai. The Memorial Hall was renovated and reopened in 1993, when scholarship on the Korean War saw rapid development after the opening of the Soviet archives. Of course, the Memorial Hall and other celebrations surrounding the Korean War are from a uniquely Chinese perspective. Many of the exhibitions or scholarship fail to recognise the extent of North Korean aggression or the reasons why China actually entered the war, or why the war took place in the first place. It seems that commemoration of the Korean War has actually been growing in importance in China. For example, in 2014, the South Korean government returned the remains of 437 members of the CPV to China, who had originally been buried in South Korea and were then reburied at the Cemetery of Martyrs in Shenyang. This is partly an effort to ease some of the tensions and hostility which still echo from the Korean War. However, true reconciliation will probably take longer than that to achieve. And that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Like I said, there should be some materials up on the Sino Babel website, so do check them out if you want to see some posters from the campaign of the Korean War. Don't forget to rate this podcast on whatever player that you're using to listen to it, and I hope you tune in to the next episode. <laughs> <laughs>